Well, it's three after. Let's get uh, let's get started. Um, feel free to continue dropping uh, your your uh, backgrounds in the chat here, but we're gonna we're gonna kick things off. So, um, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is uh, Alex Elaine. I'm the CTO here at US Digital Response. Um, my background's uh, primarily in, originally in technology. Was at Dropbox as director of engineering for about eight years before um, before this and. Uh, Really excited to uh, share with all of you some of the work we've been doing here uh, behind the scenes at USDR. Um, for those who aren't familiar, um, USDR, we're a uh, nonprofit organization that started in March of 2020, originally to help governments um, who were you know, supporting people in that crisis moment with technology kind of behind the scenes. And you know, when we started, we originally thought we'd be around maybe for a few weeks, a few months, uh, unfortunately, we we <laughs> didn't COVID did not go away, but one of the things we learned throughout that work was there are a bunch of common patterns and a common set of needs that we were hearing from governments. And so what we discovered is that there's really an opportunity for us to help scale up reusable or generalizable solutions to some of that work. And so that brings us to today, which is um, we want to take folks behind the scenes a little bit. And while we normally talk about all of the 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 you know impact of the work that we're we're supporting our government partners in having. Uh, today, we want to take you behind the scenes a little bit, share a little bit more with the technologists and the technology behind the work. Um, I saw some of you are interested in learning about civic tech, potentially making a move into civic tech. So this should give you, we're hoping this will really give you a little bit of an idea of what that will be like uh, and learn a little bit more about how technology is similar and, and different in the in the civic tech space. So with that being said, um, definitely want to welcome uh, questions from all of you all um, anytime throughout this uh, chat. So please just drop them in the uh, chat if there's anything you want to know, and um, I'll make sure to, to pick those up uh, so that we cover them. Um, all right, well, let's get started. Um, so I want to just introduce our other panelists here. Um, we have today um, Mindy Wang, who is the product manager for the uh, grants portfolio on our economic stability team and formerly a product manager from Google. Um, Ty Hendrickson, who is the tech lead um, on that team, and uh, formerly the VP of Engineering at United Health, and um, finally, last but not least, uh, Andrew Hindman, who is a volunteer engineer on the team, and um, after my own heart, a senior software engineer at Dropbox. Um, all right, let's dive in. Um, Mindy, uh, just to set the stage a little bit, um, can you share? You know, what is the, the grants ecosystem that we're talking about? Why is this work important and, and why do governments need help? Yeah, well, funny you should ask, uh, Alex. I think this can be best expressed in a series of just a few slides. So let me pull that up. <laughs> Here we go. So federal funding, what is federal funding? Well, federal funding are things like the CARES Act, things like the American Rescue Plan that was passed in 2020. More recently, um, uh, bills and programs within uh, the IJA, the Infrastructure Bill, um, and also the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, that you may have heard of. Uh, all of this is hitting American people really fast. It's a kind of a once in a lifetime influx of federal funding that's coming to folks. Um, here's the thing though, with this influx, all of our governments need to, just like any other type of grants, federal, uh, federal grants require people to kind of um, look, discuss, under, know that the grants exist, apply for them, um, use the money and a report back on how the money was used. So imagine that you have trillions of dollars coming through a system that used to only handle, let's say, a few million, billions of dollars. But now you have trillions. Trillions is a lot of money. Um, and that's overwhelming your legacy systems. Um, and when that happens, then you have governments and projects that can't find the money. There's literally so much of it coming out. Um, they can't track the money. There's so much that is getting used. And it's really hard to report on it because there's just so much of it, your old system of um, Excel spreadsheets, emailing people, that's just not scaling anymore. And when that happens, that creates huge bottlenecks. And what the result is that everyday American people are not getting the assistance that they need. So that's what's going on. 
Um, and to set the stage a little bit about how USDR is playing in the space. Um, so across the grants life cycle of what I said, applying for tracking reporting, we do have several tools around there. Um, and I will stop right there. That's kind of like the overview of what federal grants are and how USDR plays in it. Terrific. And what, what gets you excited about this work? Oh man, what gets me excited about this work? Um, I feel like this work is a perfect problem space for technology. Why do I say that? There's so much work out there that is currently manual that can be automated. And once it's automated, that can help people scale, right? Um, it's frankly, it's toil. <laughs> and you should, that should be done by machines. Um, I'll give you a very concrete example. Let me pull up a uh, different set of slides. Uh, let me go into one single tool out of the suite of tools that we have to really emphasize what I mean when I say all the work is manual right now. Um, so let's say that you have, you as a government, you have like $5 billion that you're reporting um, for the American Rescue Plan. And uh, the key to grants reporting, there are three major uh, problem areas that we have found while talking to our grants partners. That's intake, transformation, and validation. Um, this is fairly similar to kind of an ETL operation. You are just kind of manually extracting information from humans, transforming it via a human, and then loading it into the treasuries, into the federal government's website by your hands and your mouse, right? Um, so you can see why this might not scale if it's all done by humans. To give a really concrete example, okay, let's say you're working in a government budget office, you've spent, what did they say, five, ten billion dollars across 800 programs, you need to report that back with qualitative information, you're, you're a budget officer sitting up here, um, you have handed out, uh, you have handed out ten billion dollars across like 800 different programs. So you've got like 800 of these agencies, nonprofits, small towns, and you're like, please let me know how you have spent the money. And what you do is um, they kind of send back 3,000 Excel spreadsheets. When I say 3,000, that's actually a number that we've seen. Um, a state budget officer is receiving 3,000 e uh, emails with files attached from various small towns saying this is how we spent the money, right? So that's like the intake problem. Um, once you have those 3,000 uh, 3, files, now your job as a, a single human is to transform it, aggregate it into a, a few CSV files because that's the format that the federal government is requiring your state to uh, send to their website. Um, we've seen that, yeah. So anyways, this takes about like a week or so of manual work. Um, and then once you're done with that, you load it to the federal government and they kick it back saying you have a type to somewhere. So, you know, technologists in the room, you're probably cringing here. Um, there's, of course, there's gonna be human errors introduced through this entire process. You have to go down the organizational stack and figure out what happened. There is no stack trace to help you out. This is just like manual human work. It kind of sucks. Um, and then to give you a quick example of like why, how USDR has helped automate it. Um, the first part of our solution was to just eliminate a little bit of rework upfront just by creating uh, our own Excel templates to, for our governments to send out to their various small towns, various nonprofits that are doing the, um, that are spending the money. Um, and we added through here automations and validations, um, designed the template to easily walk people through. Because what we were seeing is every government was kind of rolling their own Excel spreadsheet and they had various levels of design and automation and validation quality within them. So we thought we could help out just by doing that. And then the next thing we did was we built a web tool where each of your 800 program managers, instead of emailing it to you, can you imagine that? Uh, they could upload it directly to uh, this website instead. And here everything's tracked version and searchable um and then you as the budget officer sitting on top in the states uh, we need to aggregate it all together instead of doing it manually now we have a single button um and what that does is just it does the transformation automatically spits it out um, into a zip file you download it and then you load it straight into treasury's website 
And this improves the overall confidence of not just saves time, it proves overall confidence in the data that is getting sent to the US government. Um, and last but not least, uh, for that validation question we're looking at, we basically created a test suite for when program managers upload the workbook to uh, in the first place to our portal, they get a list of errors, they get exactly where it's happening, um, and they can just you know, debug at the lowest level, exactly where it happens, close that feedback loop. So all these concepts of versioning, testing, transforming, they are, these are commonplace ideas in tech, not necessarily in government. Um, and by introducing this, by um, building and co-designing alongside our government partners and collaboratively building out these ideas, these solutions, we have saved thousands and thousands of hours per year per uh, government partner um and everyone's happier for it and that's why i'm excited about this work alex i don't know if you can tell i just kind of went off on it <laughs> i i got some idea yeah <laughs> saving saving toil uh and doing it at scale is uh what technology is all about all right well let's shift a little bit to talking about the work that went um went into this and, um, you know, just to kick things off, um, I know we've got folks who are on the call curious about what is it actually like working with uh, some of our government partners. So let's let's actually start there and then we'll get into some of the 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 tech behind this. So, um, Andrew, I'd love to hear from you on this one. What what has it been like just kind of coming in as a volunteer and, and engaging with uh, with governments? Thanks, Alex. Um, I have a lot of good things to say about my time at USDR. Just to give a little quick background, I started um, working with USCR as a volunteer in January this year. Um, and I spent most of this year working on exactly the tool that Mindy was just showing off, um, which has been really rewarding. Um, so our process working with government partners has been um, basically uh, built around weekly meetings directly with the partners. So as a foundation for figuring out what to do, um, planning the work, sharing our plans with the uh, partners, um, we just have weekly meetings directly with the users who are actually going to use our tool, which in the diagrams Mindy was showing is generally the, uh, the budget officers um, at the state level um, who, most, who are the most prolific uh, in users of, of our web tool. Um, it's as a as a volunteer. Um, it's been uh, I'm very closely connected to, of course, all of the engineering work that gets done, but also to the decision making in the project. Um, so I find uh, working in an environment like this, which is kind of small, working on a really tangible product, um, is is very. Um, very satisfying because I get to talk to the partners. They tell me exactly what they need. I build a thing that's designed exactly to solve the problem they describe. I go back the next week and I can see them use it. They say, thank you. Um, it's very cool. All right, I love it. Yeah, it's our whole, and it's our whole philosophy, you know, work, work really closely with a, you know, specific folks who know the problem really well and understand it. And only then do we start to think about scaling it. So let's um, let's shift a little bit to once we've got that <laughs> insight um, and we have something we think might might solve a common problem. Um, let's talk about scaling. And so um, Ty and Andrew, I'm curious if you could just share what have been some of the biggest challenges the the team has had to face. Yeah, I think so. It's, um, I I think that going from uh, you know designing very partner specific solutions and then rolling them out on a very partner specific basis so it's you know very much of a handoff um we built it here you go you can host it um to making things more hosted in a multi-tenant kind of style where we have a centrally hosted solution that folks can um log into and uh you know have more of a uh single pane of, of um, management glass that we can use to roll out new features and updates um, more rapidly rather than kind of going one by one across the board, um, you know, has, has had some challenges, but ultimately been pretty successful. I'm trying to figure out how to fit that into uh, the right timing windows, those kinds of bigger technological efforts is also really challenging, um, really fun problem to solve on a small project like this. 
Um, another uh, note I'll just throw in there is um, an extra challenge that we run into with this project that I haven't had to deal with uh, before is, is working so closely with Excel. So pretty early in this project, um, we made the decision to try to kind of fit as close as, as seamlessly as possible into our end users workflows. And they are all at every level using Excel files to manage um, to manage their, their work, their, their data. And that actually even includes the, the federal treasury uh, department. They expect a CSV file to be uploaded to which they no doubt load into a database. But to provide templates for the CSV file that they want uploaded, they provide Excel files, uh, which is just a fun anecdote. Um, and Excel is uh, not something that I've spent a lot of time working with. Uh, I like I probably spent more time in Google, Google Sheets than in Excel. And there's lots of interesting uh, edge cases for Excel. But then beyond that, um, Excel is, or with our work specifically, we are um, you know, trying to solve some of this transform and aggregation problem, which means we need to not only like uh, have build a, an Excel template and, and share that, but we also need to be able to programmatically interact with the Excel sheet that users are uploading. Um, so that's, it turns out there is some, some open source work that we can lean on that gets us pretty far, but um, definitely a lot of new things that I've had to learn. And, uh, it's, it, it's an ongoing challenge, I would say, to try to figure out how to manage and scale um, versioning and, and history and, and code management as it interfaces with Excel files. Yeah, I think you know, you're really touching on something that's so important here, which is fitting into the existing workflows and making the technology work for what's there rather than trying to change how people are working. And maybe there are opportunities to do that when there's something that makes people more efficient, but um, you know, it's gotta it's gotta seem natural and seamless for all those existing workflows. And so thank you also for <laughs> diving into some new technology. Um, you did mention something I thought was pretty interesting that um, I wanted to touch on, which is kind of timing and fitting around windows of, um, can, can you talk a, a little bit more uh, about that? Like which windows are we talking about? Are these the yeah, so windows? that's right. The, the grant reporting windows are uh, a very um, uh, big milestone in our in our workflow in our in our cycle development cycle. So every um, with the ARPA reporting specifically, which I've been working on, um, ARPA stands for American Rescue Plan Act. Um, and probably a lot of people here do know that already, but um, for those that don't, and this this grant program uh, requires quarterly reporting, and so every quarter um, states are collecting all of this data, aggregating and reporting it, and also every quarter the federal government updates their guidance, which means that every quarter we might have like a slightly moving target for requirements for our software, um, and we have to make sure that we're uh, up to date and stable for the reporting cycle. Um, and then big changes have to happen between those reporting cycles. That's really helpful. Yes, yeah, so we've got this uh, kind of launch calendar that's defined, uh, defined for us. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit more about the um, technology side. Um, I'm curious to hear from folks, just what's your favorite kind of clever or engineering solution or uh, to a, a, one of the tricky problems that we faced in, in doing this work? I don't know that this is necessarily an engineering solution, but I want to add a little anecdote to what Andrew was talking about earlier with Excel's integration point. Um, as the PM, I think this is my favorite clever solution. Um, as he said, government at all levels work on Excel and the anecdote I love to use to highlight this is I was in a meeting uh, with a state and both their CTO and their budget officer, their chief budget officer was present. Um, and I was demoing the tool to them. And when I showed them that we had an Excel spreadsheet as kind of quote unquote like our front end to intake the information, the CTO was stunned. He was sitting there like, Excel, but where's your where's your web for? <laughs> like what what is what are you doing? And the budget officer immediately looked over to him and snaps, 
No, Excel is the best thing in the universe. All financial officers use Excel. Do not change this. This is the best thing in the world. So it was <laughs> so one of those moments where it's like, okay, this is definitely a moment where you like knowing your users um, is extremely powerful because with Excel now you slot so seamlessly into every single process that the government has because every single process already runs on Excel. That That's me. Pick one specific anecdote. Um, we early on in, the, in this project, we we decided to start with um, an existing code base. So we pulled some code from the CARES reporting cycle, um, which has similar but different requirements. Again, um, as a as a starting point for to solve some of the boilerplate, give us a bit of a web portal framework to work with. Um, and, and lean on that to build the ARPA reporting tool. And um, just one fun thing that we were able to do in this project was um, at some point we noticed that we were uh, in an early version of this, basically, we were taking data from this Excel spreadsheets and then um, ultimately we need to aggregate, transform and output that into a new set of CSV files. And so uh, early on in that, a process we assumed that you know if we were working in this web form world what we would have done is have an input form take that data save it in a database in a structured format and then take that database data and uh, aggregate and output our, our csv files but in this case since we already have these excel files um, that are you know uh, have um, stability like they're they exist and they have data. Uh, they're not transient like a web form. Um, we realized we didn't necessarily need the database layer in between, and that would also make us more resilient to changes in requirements. Uh, we didn't have to worry about data getting duplicated in two places and which is the source of truth. So we were able to eliminate the, well, we still have a database to track uh, metadata about uploads, for example, and, and how they relate to one another, but we were able to eliminate the duplicated data in the database. And now we can directly extract from um, uploaded Excel sheets and output the CSV files required. Oh, I like that. It's kind of counterintuitive that things get easier without a database, but, <laughs> but it just shows the power of kind of thinking. Well, less moving parts, I think. <laughs> exactly. The, thinking carefully about the problem domain. Awesome. Well, I just want to, um, as a reminder for anyone uh, who joined recently in the audience, if you have any questions uh, throughout the panel, um, please just drop them in chat. We are eager to hear what you would like to learn. Um, and otherwise, um, I am going to shift gears a little bit to looking ahead. Um, so, you know, we've built all of this uh, system out so far, um, but what's coming next? So um, just open it up to everyone in the panel, like, um, what are some of the things that are coming up next that y'all are excited about? Uh, so we had a, actually a great um, post-mortem chat internally recently after our last set of uh, releases and project releases. And one of the big things that came out of that was um, we'd really like to uh, scale up our design muscle. So like I said, I've been in a situation where I can sit directly with partners, talk to them, figure out what they need and try and build the thing that I think will solve that. Um, but I think it'd be super cool to have uh, some extra expertise on the design and user research um, fronts who can help us think not just about the immediate problem, but about how to you know, make the whole thing make sense, uh, all of our, connect all of our projects together, um, improve the usability of our systems uh, and so forth. So I'm very excited about where that's going. Definitely. Um, and as part of that, it's part of adding design, um, like a more rigorous design practice uh, to our to our work. Early on, especially with the ARPA tool, we were building like really fast MVPs. Um, but we're looking forward to scaling all of our tools, all of our suite of tools to more partners. Today, we have uh, seven folks signed up across a bunch of different tools. Um, we're aiming to get this national, to get this across all levels of government. So that's what I'm really uh, excited and looking forward to. Yeah, for, for my part, I, um, I think working on things like increasing the focus on 
um, scalability and um, platform reliability so that, you know, um, through more advanced logging and monitoring and just overall observability kinds of practices, we um, we have a better sense of uh, what our users are experiencing and can react or be more proactive in, in how we address that. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunities as our uh, developers, especially the volunteers, are looking to improve the uh, operational experience of the people using our platform and, you know, make, um, make it easier for them to uh, do their good and necessary work with less toil. I want to do the same for those developers. Um, so, you know, really focusing in on the developer experience and um, making sure that their ability to make impactful contributions is as easy as possible. And I think all of that kind of rolls up into a theme about just thinking about operational excellence in general, which I think is a, a common theme in the um, technology industry and um, thinking about how that really fits into civic tech um, and what, you know, the, the difference between, you know, um, enterprise, uh, for-profit operational excellence in uh, platforms compares um, and contrasts to what that looks like in the civic space. All very related to this theme of uh, scaling up uh, to support more folks as well. Yep. If you, uh, you gotta gotta keep those two hand in hand. Um, all right. Well, we talked a little bit about what you're excited about. Let's talk a little bit more about what some of the engineering challenges are. What um, what are the ones that you just can't stop thinking about? For me, I think it's how we bring some of that um, low code velocity that is kind of fundamental to the, the origin of USDR um, with us as we seek to embrace higher code benefits that come along with source control, um, improve governance risk and compliance and automation. Um, and I, I think that the, the ability to look at, um, you know, kind of a deliverable like Excel, which is, as many mentioned, is like really important to the, the folks using our platform and think about um, how can we manage uh, Excel in a way where, you know, an Excel file can be a deployment artifact or something like that, that, uh, you know, allows for the same level of auditability and um, quality control that you get out of, you know, let's say a, a Python module, um, but, you know, where, where instead of a uh, package or a binary, you're, you're actually distributing an Excel file to, to your end users. Yeah, and very similarly, um, I think I'm really happy, honestly, with, with where we've gotten over this year with the tools that I've been a part of. Um, I feel like we do a really good job of, uh, you know, focusing on the immediate need. Um, we're surprisingly disciplined for a volunteer organization um, when it comes to deadlines and, and you know, uh, making sure that we accommodate um, these uh, reporting cycles. And we've had really good success there. But at the same time, um, yeah, as we scale to more states just for this one tool, and as we add more tools to our suite, um, I'm very interested in our, I keep thinking about uh, how we are going to scale our code base and, and um, keep our foundations strong so that we can continue to move with the same velocity um, for future work. And uh, that includes things like um, recently I've been just thinking about folder structures in our repository or um, the shape of data in the database and how, you know, schema design um, and so goes deeper than that, but there's a couple items. All right, I see a couple of questions coming in the chat. I'd love to, to uh, tackle these. Um, so the first one from, from Vincent is, um, I think piggybacking off what I was saying, we hear a lot about low code, no code solutions. 
um, and asking just, is this an approach government agencies are actively adopting? Um, I don't know if I, I can kind of take this one a little bit uh, for, for folks, actually. Um, I think the, you know, it, there's a lot of different governments <laughs> around the country. There are 19,000 cities and 3,000 counties. We have seen um, a lot of interest from uh, the government partners that we've worked with in low-code uh, tools. Um, we actually wrote a whole series on our um, on our, our blog, uh, which we can post in the chat here, kind of covering some of the lessons learned from that. Um, one of the things that's been really powerful about low-code tools, and I think why they come up so often, is they're approachable by folks who might not identify as like an engineer or a technologist, uh, but allow them to have a lot of the same superpowers that um, engineers or technologists kind of can have in terms of being able to create automation, leverage from automation. Um, and I think that we're seeing sort of more and more, um, I, I hear more and more interest in, in these kinds of tools, especially as, uh, you know, governments are being asked to do more um, and, you know, accomplish more with the, the same number of people. So um, thank you for that question. Um, and um, Rafa, you had a, another great question here um, asking about um, working with Excel. Um, so how do we think about establishing broader tech or process guardrails when we're going through a product development cycle? Um, does this come out of user research or are there other ways to think about this? I don't know if uh, Ty or Mindy, you wanna, you wanna jump in on that? Yeah, I, I think Mindy can, can speak much better than I can about the, the user research part of it. Um, but I, I think as far as, you know, the, the tech and process guardrails um, that factor into the development cycle, um, that's kind of what I was getting at uh, recently with, you know, thinking about things like Excel as um, a deployment artifact. Um, I think that in general, uh, an ongoing theme for us at USDR is thinking about what an ideal ecosystem, and that includes those kinds of GRC considerations, um, for building and maintaining collaborative civic solutions um, is, you know, that's a, a big thing that, that we're thinking about kind of every day as, as we build things and um, trying to find the right balance between um, getting that most usable end result that, you know, uh, folks who work in finance are, are going to be really comfortable with an Excel file, but how do we bring um you know the the right level of quality control and security guardrails in place um you know those are are things we're thinking about a lot on the user side of things um we in terms of user research so usdr the core of usdr has always been co-designing and building rapid solutions uh in collaboration with our government partners. It's no different for these tools. They all started with uh, co-designing weekly meetings every week, sitting with uh, two of our first users, um, our first government partners. Um, we like to have two because then we know we're not overfitting to any single one. But uh, having two in the room that we can come back week after week um, with demos, Right, so if you see Alex's background, this is demos, not memos. Another one of our philosophies is just get the get a mock up, get an MVP up, bring it straight to them, um, and they they'll tell you exactly what is useful and what is not. Um, as we scale, we also see like it's still it's still incredibly useful and fruitful having our two um, our few partners that we develop an MVP with, but also making sure to reach out to um, other governments that we already have relationships with to get their insight and their feedback um, as we're as we're building out uh, the, the solution itself to really guide what we're building. Um, and then once we've hit an MVP phase, that's when we can really take a step back. Um, and then that becomes a, it becomes a more iterative a building cycle after that, where we're seeking maybe more incremental feedback. Um, and that's probably where a more uh, traditional like user research um, and product development cycle uh, will, will come into play. But at the beginning, it's, ve it's very entrepreneurial. It's very much like, hey, here's a problem. We're going to take a stab at it um, and we're going to do the best we can to make sure it solves real user problems. And that's why we have uh, at least two people working with us, because even if we overfit to two, we've already solved two government partners issues. That's already huge. Yeah, I just want to chip in on that and say that um, as a volunteer, as an engineer working in that kind of environment with. Um, I really noticed that 
and appreciate the discipline in, in how we um, source and manage partners. Because I, th I think in even in um, the professional world, I've seen a lot of teams succumb to the temptation to either overfit to one big client or to try to scale too quickly before you have something that solves the problem. Um, and so both of those things, uh, I think have worked really well for us um, to keep us focused on real problems and make sure that we're uh, that we can um, make progress before uh, and, and solve the problem before uh, before overscaling. Alex, I see the next uh, question from Aaron here, and I would love to take this one on. <laughs> All um, right, let's let's do it. <laughs> the origin of the need. So we're talking specifically about the reporting tool here. Um, we have a suite of different tools, and USDS philosophy is really to fill gaps in need. Um, specifically for the reporting tool, this is not a lucrative place for vendors to sit because uh, reporting requirements change between um, program to program. So every single new acts every single new amount of federal money that gets sent out that is all different and it's it's um there's a lifespan to each one of those so uh infrastructure bills um because they sit around for a really long time people will have to report them that for about seven years so the lifespan of any product you develop there is seven years but there's a lot shorter ones too the coronavirus relief act that reporting was only around two years so what vendor in the right mind would say, hey, let's spin up a solution that we can only solve for two years, and then we'll have to go back um, and start from scratch, right? And what that leaves is a gaping hole in the entire process where no one was really to step in because there's not a lot of money to be made that way. That's one of the places that USDR plays. Another one that we play in is sort of like the discovery and application side of things. There are vendors on that side of, um, on that side of the world, but here's the thing is that vendors charge a lot of money and they kind of leave a lot of the smaller governments behind. So there's also this, uh, this equity lens that USDR is bringing to it. Can we bring the help um, at the quality uh, that vendors bring, but to the smaller governments who would otherwise be left behind? You know, Mindy, this is actually a, a really natural segue to something I was, I was gonna ask you about, which is, you know, what do you think the ideal solution here would look like? What is like the perfect world in the state? Absolutely. Um, so this is something that we are working towards. Uh, USDR as a whole, but um, one thing we found is it's it was extremely effective also to build connection and collaboration with the federal government because ultimately, especially on the reporting side of things, that's where the requirements are coming down from. Um, so one thing, uh, so for example, on the reporter side of things, we are collaborating with them to make sure that our uh, the you know the artifacts we produce do integrate with our system. Um, I think the ideal solution is to really get ahead of, um, as Andrew had said before, every quarter there's like a little bit of change that happens in each of the requirements that leads to like a lot of downstream churn, not just for us, but also for all of our government partners. If we can get ahead of that, right, if we can work, be working hand in hand to get those requirements as they come out, um, that'll just make a lot, make that'll enable us to make changes ahead of time and really seamlessly integrate um, with rest. So I think uh, the ideal solution is really collaborating more closely, I think, with upstream. Terrific. Um, but also, Alex, I wanted to, to turn this one back on you because this is that is just one strategy for this one particular tool. Um, how is USDR kind of thinking of like our, our ultimate ideal end state in this world? Well, that's a that's a great question. Um, and I think one of the big things that we've discovered is the value of playing a connective role across the ecosystem. You know, there are, I said this before, thousands of counties, tens of thousands of cities in the US. Um, how do we help connect them, not just to each other as peers when we find that multiple of them are solving the same kinds of problems, but across different levels of government as well. One of the things that I've been personally surprised by is how many times folks maybe at the federal level have asked us, what are you like, for example, when we've been working on unemployment insurance, a totally different um, problem from the from federal grant reporting? Um, what are you hearing from uh, from state unemployment insurance offices? What do they need? Um, there's often, I think, some hesitancy to collaborate really closely for you know, a variety, I guess, a variety of reasons. But uh, having a, a kind of outside player in the space can actually help bring 
more people together and share knowledge more efficiently. And I think that's one of the really important things that USDR can do in the ecosystem, uh, particularly because as you start to bring people together who might not have been collaborating before, you can start to get more, both more shared solutions, but also more effective shared solutions that are um, more effective than anything that any one place would come up with themselves because you're getting a more holistic view of the problem space, as you were just talking about being able to work with both the, with both the federal uh, level and at state and, and county and city level. All right, um, we've got just about 15 minutes left. Um, thanks for all the questions so far. Again, if you've got anything that's caught your ears, uh, please do uh, drop in more questions in the chat. But I'd like to shift a little bit for um, uh, for folks who are in the audience, maybe thinking about what it's like to work in civic tech. Um, so I want to focus a little bit for our panelists on on their experiences. Um, so just first of all, um, you know, for folks here who've kind of worked in um, engineering uh, in kind of big tech or corporate tech or whatever, um, how has it been? Uh, how has it been the same or different working in uh, civic tech so far? Yeah, and I can speak to that because I'm currently working in both. <laughs> um, yeah, there's definitely some really interesting differences working uh, in a volunteer basis and on projects like this versus the corporate tech um, in industry. Uh, first, I think I touched a little bit on it earlier too, but just to, to recap, um, it's you're much closer to the customer working in uh, on projects like ARPA, um, in volunteer organization like USDR. Um, I find it really satisfying to be working on a project that is so tangible as well. And by that, I mean, like, um, sometimes in the day to day in, in industry, I'll be, uh, you know, I'll be on a team, that team will have some initiative that our project manager came up with that ladders up to some quarterly OKR that was set based on some strategic objective that a leader decided on. And like, I don't necessarily understand how what I'm doing actually connects to any kind of user value on the other end, although it may well do so. Um, but in this case, I'm working on, uh, to pick a specific example, like I'll sit in a meeting with our state partners they um, describe to us how they are like cross-checking our output to make sure that it's got all the data that they're looking for. Um, and they're doing that by literally taking all of those uploaded spreadsheets, re-downloading them and like copy pasting rows into a new spreadsheet and then summing a row to see if that value looks the same as what we're getting in our generated output. And so I can hear them talk about this manual process we can creatively come up with a solution. And in this case, um, our solution is just to generate alongside of our, uh, alongside of our um, treasury output, an audit report output. And that audit report is just a, another spreadsheet that has, um, that aggregates the data in a different way. So maybe we just take all of the rows and uh, can, you know, list them all out in a single tab and uh, put that alongside the, the final treasury report. And then we can go back to the users afterward and show them what we've got. They can prove that that works, show me how their workflow, how that fits into their workflow. Um, and it's just very rewarding to see that all come together. Um, and I'll, another thing just that's interesting, I think about work like this compared to work in big tech, if you will, uh, is um, these problems are not like pie in the sky, kind of change the world problems, but they're very well understood problems. This is just manual data entry. This is like take data from one system, and put it into another system. This is, we've got a bunch of rows of data. Let's just sum them up in, in a different format. Like it's very, um, I, I know that I know how to do what I'm trying to do and I know that it will solve the problem and then it does solve the problem. And at the end of the day, someone says, thank you. It's very cool. Right. Wow, we're getting a, a number of good questions in the chat. So I'm going to just take us back there for a sec. Um, so first um, question is, are there any uh, liaisons with US uh, DS, US Digital Service? Um, I know that we, in a number of USDR's projects, have had those liaisons. Mindy, can you speak to that for uh, this one in particular? 
Uh, for the grants project specifically, we do not, we are not in contact with USDS. We are in contact with other uh, federal teams, however. Terrific. Ooh. Um, I love these new questions that are coming in. Um, if, if we could uh, have... If you want to be in contact with us, we're, we're here listening and we love everything you're saying. So we'd love to chat. Absolutely. Ooh, I'll wow. reach out Look to you. This. Real time. I love it. Um, all right. Um, Lucas asks, if you could have your partners on the federal side who are granting the funds make one realistic change to the grant making and grants reporting that would improve the experience for communities, what would you suggest? Real okay. Um, I, they're starting. They're starting to do this. Uh, so I guess the ask is to really continue um, or make it. Uh, anyways, I'll just I'll just answer. Um, right now, a lot of requirements and policies that are handed down from the federal government are done so without a lot of feedback from state, local, and tribal tribal governments. What this means is that there's a huge disconnect between uh, the people who are writing and writing down and saying, hey, you need to get me like these 300 data points every quarter. Um, and they're writing it down without really understanding on the ground what that means for the program managers who have to acquire those 300 data points from their, from each of their 800 uh, subgrantees. Um, it's a ton of work. There are ways to design those 300 data points to make it easier to collect um, or make it more clear to collect. Uh, this last, for the ARPA uh, reporting, they, they started having a little more of those conversations up front, but it was only really three weeks before the final guidelines were released. So, you know, state, local, tribal governments didn't really get a say in like how it was designed up front. So my wish is for the federal government to really start talking to state, local, and tribal governments very early on in the reporting design process. And that's going to save um, a ton, a ton of uh, overhead and administrative burden on the ground. So user research is really my ask. Terrific. Uh, and um, me following up somewhat on that, I, in a way, um, Rafa asks, unlike tech companies, governments can't quite prioritize or deprioritize users to focus on. Government has to serve everyone. Um, given that, uh, what are other levers we have for, for speed or moving quickly? Um, Mindy or Ty, I'm curious if you all have any thoughts on this. I also have a few myself. Yeah, so I can speak for the grants program specifically, which is our for us actually our users are the government is the government itself. Um, so we're we're not uh, serving like the we're not directly serving uh, people everyday people in the U.S. But I know that the rest of USDR may have had uh, have done stuff like that. So Alex, over to you. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that we've seen is that there's a lot of new. Um, sort of tech coming out more recently, especially I mentioned before, low code, no code tools that are out there. Um, and I think that those are one of the levers that we found incredibly powerful for moving quickly because they empower people who are close to the work to uh, make their own work more efficient. And, and that that's just improving the efficient frontier versus making a prioritization call on who you're serving. And so, um, you know, that that's a really exciting thing for me because it allows us to help both develop solutions that are, are simply more faster to develop than it would have been a few years ago because you're not doing everything in code. It's bringing the solutions closer to the people who know the problem domain, which actually improves, I think, in many cases, the quality of the service delivery because it's the, the folks on the front lines um, who are actually solving the problems directly and saying, oh, I need this thing. Let me, uh, let me go and make this change in this low code tool. Uh, and uh, as a result, and that also means it's something they can maintain and 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 continue to use versus a piece of software that you know you you might you you can't assume that they'll be able to maintain that if if you build it. And so those are some things that we've found um, just more recently has been really powerful um, for um, being able to move quickly and in a, in a, a more e effective way for the entire community. Just to jump in two way, I, I think that um, you know like you might see at a tech company, um, 
some of the the ways we can move faster or, or um, improve velocity are just by opening up feedback loops. And if it's really easy for the folks who are using or or our stakeholder in um, the the products that we're putting out um, to to raise ideas or issues that they might be having, and then uh, turn that quickly into uh, an open source issue that a volunteer can jump on or, or somebody can come and open a pull request on one of our repositories um, that, you know, helps us uh, not need to be so choosy about um, which users we're going to focus on. We can, you know, collect feedback from all sorts of users and rapidly work that into uh, where the product is going. So it's kind of combining that that uh, tech company um, idea of, of the feedback loops with uh, maybe the, the benefits of being open source and um, having the volunteer superpowers that we have. Yeah, being able to say yes to things is very exciting. We have so many people who are here to here who want to help. Um, I guess I didn't give people a sense of scale at the beginning. We've got about 7,000 people who've raised their hands to, to volunteer, and we've had over 900 folks deployed. So uh, that's really exciting. All right, we're um, coming down to the wire. Uh, these are wonderful questions. I do want to uh, ask uh, for the folks who've made the transition into civic tech, what has that been like? I can start. Um, there is a surprising amount of transferable skills, actually. Uh, so <clears throat> before this, I worked at Google, um, big, big organization technical and non-technical stakeholders. I specifically worked on Android Automotive and the automotive industry. So a lot of like C systems to, to integrate with their, a lot of um, regulation and compliance. Um, and all of those skills came over like one to one uh, when I came over here, it's, it's the same. Yeah. Um, Get, ha, knowing organizational savvy, knowing how to talk, knowing knowing how to talk to external stakeholders, internal stakeholders, um, and understanding like the bureaucracy that your government partners are likely facing, and uh, how you can help them navigate that. Um, so those, it's like it's surprisingly, uh, <clears throat> yeah, a surprising amount of stuff carries over. Yeah, coming coming from uh, the healthcare industry, I think that. Um, you know, this is also as as that was um, uh, a vertical with a lot of um, a lot of legacy, um, and I think that you know being smart about uh, how to respect what's worked about those legacy systems while also um, you know being real about uh, ways that maybe they've fallen behind and can be improved upon or augmented in some way. Um, that's uh, pretty much one-to-one -one kind of mindset from uh, pre-civic tech to transition into it. I'll add one more thing, which is that I feel like the civic tech space, um, it's pretty, if, to me, it feels small compared to uh, small in terms of not the problems we're solving, but in terms of like the people, because I see the same people um, working on similar problems throughout their entire careers. And when you make a connection, it feels like a really strong connection to the space, which I, I really, really enjoy it compared to, um, I, I feel like in my previous role, maybe connections came, sort of came in once, uh, but uh, it's it's been nice to like really make solid uh, solid networks and connections and know who the experts are in the space to talk to here. All right, yeah. So you can all come join us and make it a little bit bigger, but join the party. Um, all right, let's do a rapid fire round to close things out. Um, what are you most proud of on your work from the grants tool so far? I am most proud whenever I demo a tool to a new government and their jaws just go like, because it turns out it's exactly what they need, um, which they're not used to seeing. And then I tell them that it's made pro bono and then they get really emotional because that means they can just start using the tool immediately without going through the standard six month to a year procurement process that they're used to. Um, and when they hear it's pro bono, uh, they get really, really emotional because you know, th these are our public servants. They've been burnt out working through the entire pandemic to the point where 
they've forgotten that there are people out there who genuinely care. So when they hear that people like technologists and volunteers are working to build things for them, I've, I've seen tears come out. It warms my heart. Yeah, I, I think um, I've, I've only been here for, for a hot minute or two, but, um, you know, so far, just some of the, the things like automating security update chores so that you know, volunteers can spend more time focusing on the things that our our, um, our partners are asking for um, has been pretty rewarding. And lately, uh, having some fun developing some zero trust CI/CD tooling to uh, deploy to uh, cloud platform as a service providers from GitHub Actions without um, without needing to worry about. Uh, having security keys to rotate and things of that nature. So interesting work. Um, I think uh, for me, um, I, I also just want to say actually, Ty has been here to help with uh, some of the fallout from a big migration we did recently to try to, which was important for um, scaling the ARPA tool to more than two states. Um, and so that's been, I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to, really, really proud that we were able to find the right window to deliver that. We didn't, we didn't lose it. Uh, we were able to get that done um, and not disrupt reporting cycles. And on that note, I think the other thing that I'm really proud of with the volunteer team is that we've been able to work so well towards the, and around the reporting cycle deadlines from, uh, for, that are required as part of orderly ARPA reporting. Um, I've done a little bit of volunteer work before USDR in kind of civic tech, and I've, it's, uh, you know, it's a hard problem to keep a volunteer team together and engaged. Um, really, it would be really easy for it to be the case that like volunteers cycle in and out and, you know, volunteer A is blocked because volunteer B isn't doing anything and then volunteer A gets distracted and goes to do something else. Volunteer B comes back and they do a little bit. Now they're blocked because volunteer A is busy. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, USDR has, has been, um, not, that has not been my experience here at all. People are engaged and um, committed to, um, to the real problems that we're, we're solving. Wonderful. I got to give Mindy some kudos. I know she's put a lot of thought into thinking about how to build a great uh, team combined uh, volunteers and staff on, on this tool. All right, well, right at time, I just want to say thank you to everyone in the audience who is here with us, and uh, as well as uh, all our panelists. And we're going to have a few links in the in the chat for folks who want to um, either join as volunteers or otherwise learn more about just being part of the civic tech space. And we also put a link to our repository. So if you want to check out the code and uh, you know make a pull request or just see what's there, please uh, feel free. Feel feel free. Um, and if you have any questions as well, you can always reach out to me um, or other folks in the panel, but uh, my email is alex at usdataresponse.org. Happy to answer any follow-up questions that people might have.